Thank you, Teresa. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Jeremiah chapter 27? Jeremiah chapter 27 this morning. As you're turning there in the year 1886, a man named Daniel B. Towner, who was actually the first uh, music director at Moody Bible Institute, was leading in revival services and music for um, the great D.L. Moody. And um, during that evening of revival services, uh, Mr. Towner was sitting there and a young man was impressed by the Holy Spirit. He had been moved during the services and he said uh, to Mr. Towner, I, I don't know exactly what to do. I will just try to trust and I will try to obey. Well, you know what that happened from that. Uh, Mr. Towner took those words, jotted them down, called his good friend, a theologian, a Reverend J.H. Samus, a Presbyterian minister and adjunct professor at Moody at that time. And thus came the five stanzas of the song that we now sing, Trust and Obey. And the first verse goes like this. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. This morning, we're in the second week of a two-week study in Jeremiah. Last week, we looked at Jeremiah 26. We're going to look at this next chapter uh, today. And if you were with us last week, you remember Jeremiah's message was not a popular message. It was a very sobering and a very solemn message to the people that they were to repent and to obey God, that he might relent from sending a disaster to them. And it went over like uh, a ton of bricks. We talked last week how there were certain gatekeepers. There were the religious establishment, the priests, the prophets, specifically the priests, who were allowing and not allowing various things. And they were working against Jeremiah. But toward the end of the chapter, we saw that wiser heads prevailed and the local officials determined that it was okay for the people to hear the word. And that's good. But where we're going today is this truth. Hearing is not enough. In fact, James tells us that we're not just to hear, but we're to do. Uh, our hearing is to be accompanied by heeding. And sometimes heeding the word of God, obeying God, is a very difficult thing. Sometimes it causes a big adjustment in our lives. Sometimes it calls us to really trust in God in things that may not make sense to us. But here in Jeremiah 27, we see that Jeremiah is speaking. And unlike last week in chapter 26, there's no verbal opposition as he is speaking. And so the message comes clear to the people. But the question is, would they obey it? And I'm sorry to tell you um, that they didn't, that they didn't. But look at Jeremiah 27 in beginning in verse 1. At the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord said to me. That's Jeremiah speaking. Make chains and yoke bars for yourselves and put them on your neck. Send word to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the Ammonites, the king of Tyre, and the king of Sidon through messengers who are coming to King Zedekiah of Judah in Jerusalem. Command them to go to their master saying, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel says, tell this to your masters. God says, by my great strength and outstretched arm, I made the earth and the people and animals on the face of the earth. I give it to anyone I please. So now I've placed all these lands under the authority of my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I've even given him the wild animals to serve him. All nations will serve him, his son, and his grandson until the time for his own land comes. And then many nations and great kings will enslave him. As for the nation or kingdom that does not serve King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and does not place its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation I will punish by sword, famine, and plague. This is the Lord's declaration until through him I have destroyed it. So you should not listen to your 
prophets, diviners, dreamers, fortune tellers, or sorcerers who say to you, don't serve the king of Babylon. They are prophesying a lie to you so that you will be removed from your land. I will banish you and you will perish. But as for the nation that will put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will leave it in his own land, and that nation will cultivate it and reside in it. This is the Lord's declaration. I spoke to King Zedekiah of Judah in the same way. Put your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Serve him and his people and live. Why should you and your people die by the sword, famine, and plague as the Lord is threatened against any nation that does not serve the king of Babylon? Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are telling you don't serve the king of Babylon, for they are prophesying a lie to you. I have not sent them. This is the Lord's declaration. And they are prophesying falsely in my name. Therefore, I will banish you and you will perish, you and the prophets who are prophesying to you. Then I spoke to the priests and all these people saying, this is what the Lord says. Do not listen to the words of your prophets. They are prophesying to you, claiming, look very soon now. The articles of the Lord's temple will be brought back from Babylon. They are prophesying a lie to you. Do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Why should this city become a ruin? Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, Father, you do not waste your word. Your word is powerful. Your word is effective. And God, when you speak truth to us, whether it be through the preaching of your word, through our daily study of your word, or through counsel that is consistent with your word, Father, you don't do so just that we would have a good feeling or that we would be able to check off a box that we have been here and done that. But God, your word is a practical word that if we will obey it, Father, we will bear fruit, good fruit unto you. So speak to us this hour. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a lot that's happening in the book of Jeremiah. In fact, there are a lot of years that are covered. And this chapter in Jeremiah 27 is actually somewhere around 11 years after what we saw last week. So we see that Jeremiah, who was threatened, who was thrown um, in a hole in the ground one time, his life was threatened. We see that this weeping prophet we mentioned last week is still prophesying. And so Jehoiakim, who was king uh, of Judah at the time we looked at last week, uh, he didn't obey the word. He was removed from his kingship by Nebuchadnezzar. Then for about three months, uh, Jehoiachin served, and then he too was removed from serving. And God placed this king, Zedekiah, here, and it's somewhere around uh, the late 500s, 598 or so um, B.C. that we see that he is speaking here. And Zedekiah, rather, had witnessed a lot in his life. Could you imagine? He wasn't with his head in the sand like an ostrich. He was observing what was happening. He was hearing Jeremiah. He saw what happened to Jehoiakim. He saw what happened to Jehoiachin. And you would think that when he saw these things fulfilled, that common sense would lead him to say, I better listen to what Jeremiah is saying. But actually the exact opposite was true. History has shown us that he didn't obey and before we close today, we'll see the results of his disobedience to the word of God. Last week we talked about how God is good and God gives us his word for our good. That's why it's important that we study God's word daily. That's why it's important that we don't just wait until Sunday, that we actually seek God. The psalmist would, would go and say, show me your way. And so as we go uh, to God's word today, I want to encourage you during the week that God is good and that he gives us his word for good. And so what was the word that God had for these five nations and for Judah, for King Zedekiah, it was this, give in to God and give in to Babylon. That's what he was saying. He was saying something that was counterintuitive. You would think many times if your nation is threatened, you would bear arms and you would fight. But God has reached the point in history now, after the people have been disobedient for a number of years, he said the best plan for you now and the right thing is not to fight it, 
to give in. So I want to look today at the Word of God as we look at Jeremiah's word to the people here. There's some truths that we see that were existent then and also in our lives today. And we want to see that God's Word is a direct Word, that it is a reliable and consistent Word, and that the Word always calls us to obey. The first thing I want you to see is God gave a direct word to the people. That's what he does. We see it in the first six verses that we just read. He gave a direct word and it was this. Again, give in, uh, acquiesce, give in to the king uh, Nebuchadnezzar that it will go easier for you at this point if rather than fighting against it or rather than trying to develop a coalition of nations or rather than looking to Egypt or trusting in situations, just give in. Now again, the message was counterintuitive because Babylon was a very wicked country. In fact, we studied about Abraham today and he was called out of an area, out of a pagan land to come and, and he was promised this land. And so now it, it sort of reverts back and here is Babylon as we're looking here in Jeremiah 27 and God is saying just give in to this pagan nation. You would think he would say fight for yourselves, fight for your freedom. But that time had passed. You know, it sort of reminds me when I was a child and uh, my maternal grandfather, Randall Wooldridge, I, I loved him. He passed away way too soon. I, I lost my, my granddad when I was 12 years old. But we used to wrestle all the time. And when we would wrestle, uh, he was strong. Now, he probably was just average strength. But to me, being a child, I felt he was really strong. And so we would wrestle and he would get me to a point and, and, and he would say, say uncle or let up. And I had a choice at that point. If I said uncle, I would get relief. If, uh, if I didn't, he said, well, maybe I need to apply a little more pressure. And so here what is happening is God is saying really to Judah, it has reached the point now. You're not standing up. You're not, not engaged with these people. These people are here and they're applying pressure and, and you've disobeyed me, we would say, for so many years. I've tried to warn you as you're heading down toward this path of destruction down the river, but it's to the point now where the best thing for you to do is to just give in. Isn't it good to know that no matter where we are, God can speak to us. Maybe we've not listened in the past, but God is so faithful that sometimes even when we can look back a year or five years or 10 years and, and say, well, God, I blew it. I missed it or whatever. God can still extend mercy. And that's what he did. And so God gives a clear picture here. He tells Jeremiah to get a wooden yoke, to place it around his neck, to, to tighten it, and to be a visible illustration of what would happen. And this was to go to each of the five kings of the people groups that are mentioned. It was most certainly to go to Zedekiah. And God basically is saying this, this is representative of what is happening to you. You have disobeyed me. You're a people who have disregarded me. And right now, uh, you're going to come under the yoke. You're going to come under the rule of Babylon. And so he tells in verse 8 and verse 13 to the nations and to King Zedekiah, he says, if you go against that, if you kick against the goads, if you fight against it, things are going to go very bad for you. The best thing at this point is to give in. But you know, we, as we saw last week, there are many voices, weren't there? And there were so many voices that were around Jeremiah at that particular time. There were priests, there were prophets, there were people who were sending conflicting messages. There were individuals who were saying the exact opposite of what Jeremiah was saying. If we had time today, we would go into chapter 28, the very next chapter, there's a prophet named Hananiah, and he symbolically breaks the yoke. And what does God tell Jeremiah? Replace the wooden yoke with an iron yoke. And so there was Hananiah that was saying, hey, don't listen to what Jeremiah is saying. It's not going to be 70 years. It's not going to be long. A couple of years, we'll be back in the land. We'll be enjoying everything that we have. All the treasures that have been taken will be brought back in. It was a false prophecy. You know, in our world today, there are many voices, and we're going to look a little bit more about how we discern God's voice compared to other things. But Proverbs says there's a way that seems right to a person, 
but its end is destruction. And so we need to be very attuned to what we hear, especially what we hear on the television, what we hear through media or social media. There are lots of people who want to give advice and give counsel, but if we study it deeply, we realize it's ungodly counsel. So you say, well, how do I know? How can I discern? We need to recognize the voice of the Lord. When, when we're around the Lord, when we're with God, when we've spent time with Him, when we've been in prayer, when we've studied His Word and, and begin to understand the mind of God, then we can distinguish what He is saying compared to what someone else may be saying. And it's not easy. It comes through discipline. Many of these people were led astray. They were hearing just what they wanted to hear rather than what they needed to hear. Now, there are a couple of points I want to bring out before we leave this and move to, to our, 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 our second uh, part of the outline. But there are times in our lives, the first is this, when God speaks directly to us. And when he speaks directly, we need to obey. And God may speak. You're, you're, you're having your time in the Lord. And let, let me encourage you, devotions are great and they can encourage. Don't ever let what somebody else says about the scripture supplant your time and your own study in the word. Don't get me wrong. I love our daily bread. I love stand firm. I know the ladies love journey. Those are great things. But be very careful. You don't lend on, lean on what other people say. I'm not saying don't use those things. They're good. But don't let them replace your own study of the word. So let's say you're studying God's word and, and um, God speaks to you directly about something. Forgive even as I have forgiven you. And immediately someone comes to your attention. What do you do? You obey. You act directly on it. God may speak to you through the Holy Spirit, may confirm something in, in your life. When God speaks directly, as we see here, he's not just blowing in the wind. He's not just wasting oxygen. He's speaking that we might act. Secondly, God speaks through the Bible. Now, God can speak through many ways. He speaks through people. He can speak through circumstances. But all of those things must be measured by what he says in the Bible. People will say, well, I want to know the will of God, but I don't know. I don't know how God is leading. Well, let me ask you, are you in the word? Are you studying God's word? Read it not just as a duty, not just for feeling. Read it with intent to obey. You say, God, what are you saying to me? What are you saying for me? What is, how are you guiding in me in this? What, what steps do you want me to take as I'm studying your word today? The people in Zedekiah's day and even Zedekiah himself, they missed and disobeyed the direct word of God. So we see that God speaks directly. But I want you to see also that God spoke authoritatively and consistently. God is consistent and he's authoritative. Notice how God describes himself to the five nations in verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> he tells the prophet, command them to go to their masters in these kingdoms. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel says, tell this to your masters. And then in verse 5, by my great strength and outstretched arm, I made the earth and the people and animals on the face of the earth. I give it to anyone I please. Now he's so pleased at this season to give rule to Nebuchadnezzar. Let me ask you this. Who better to get counsel from guidance than the one who created all of the earth, who created you? And so God is saying, listen, I'm speaking authoritatively here. I'm not some emissary. I'm not some second hand. I am the Lord God who created this earth. I'm the Lord God who knows how this earth works. And this is what I'm saying. And he's very clear. He said the people would serve Nebuchadnezzar, his son, and his grandson. Look at verse 7. He said all nations will serve him. What's the antecedent or that that comes to what does him point back to? It points back to Nebuchadnezzar, would serve Nebuchadnezzar, all right? And then his son, which would be the next generation, and then his grandson. And so he said, this isn't going to be forever. It's going to be three generations. And we know it was just as it was said, and we'll see in a moment, 70 years. They would serve Babylon for 70 years. In fact, God told the prophet Isaiah that much over 100 years earlier. You see, Isaiah was a prophet who had preached well before things that are happening now would happen. And he called them 
just as they were. You see, there's power in God's word. It transcends time. It applies. Some people say, well, the Bible's antiquated. No, the Bible is not antiquated. The Bible addresses all times. It gives counsel in every situation. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so we see here in Jeremiah's day, there were many false prophets. How could they know who was speaking the truth? And the answer is consistency, consistency. In other words, the prophets that were false prophets, they were making up, conjuring up things that they thought would please the people that would suit themselves. There was no history. They had no understanding of, of Old Testament history. They had no understanding of what God had said. Now, we're going to jump a little bit today. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is some 700 years before this prophecy that we're looking at today. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 17 and 18, the people were preparing to enter into the land. It was around the mid-1400s B.C., some 700 years before these words. And he says in Deuteronomy 30, verse 17 and 18, to the people of God, the, the Israelites, but if your heart turns away and you do not listen and you're led astray to bow and worship to other gods and serve them, I tell you today that you will certainly perish and will not prolong your days in the land you're entering to possess across the Jordan. God said, if you disobey, you won't prolong your days. You won't stay there. Look back um, to Leviticus, just a couple of books earlier, chapter 26, verses 32 through 34. This is even more specific, some 700 years before. Leviticus 26, verses 32 through through 34. This is prophecy. I will also devastate the land so that your enemies who come to live there will be appalled by it. What does he say? The land's going to be torn up. But I will scatter you among the nations. I will draw a sword to chase after you. That's what happened to Zedekiah. So your land will become desolate and your cities will become ruins. Then look at what it says, verse 34. Then the land will make up for its Sabbath years during the time it lies desolate while you're in the land of your enemies. At that time, the land will rest and make up for its Sabbaths. This was spoken 700 years before this. For 490 years, they had neglected the Sabbath year that was given in Leviticus 25. They neglected it, and God was a God of detail. One-seventh of 490 was 70 years. They didn't follow the Sabbath year law, and God made it exactly 700 years. He says, you're going to be in, and the land is going to make up for it, and that's what happened. Look at Isaiah 39. So we're going from... That, it actually was about 800. I said 700 is about 800 years. And we go to Isaiah. And we're going to look at Isaiah in chapter 39, verses 5 through 7. This was in the days of Hezekiah, who was a good king, but not a perfect king. And so what he did, he made a mistake. God extended his life, and Hezekiah allowed, allowed an envoy from envoy rather from uh, Babylon to come in and see the treasures in the temple and the palace. That was a mistake. Now this was years and years before what we see happening here. Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of armies. Isaiah 39 verse 5, look the days are coming when everything in your palace and all that your pre predecessors have stored up until today will be carried off where? To Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your descendants who come from you, whom your father, whom your father will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. That was spoken some hundred years before what we see happening here. So God is saying 800 years before, he's saying 100 years before, you're going to leave the land when you disobey. And then lastly, Jeremiah. We look in Jeremiah just a couple of chapters back from where we are, chapter 25 and verse 11. Verse 
This whole land will become a desolate ruin, Jeremiah says, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Now what do we see? A consistency. All the way from Leviticus and Deuteronomy, it said, so if we were living in that day, are we going to listen to people conjuring up? Are we going to listen to what had been said historically? Which all of those things were the word of God. Well, how does this apply to us? Let me give you an illustration. Imagine you're in the workplace, you're a man, and you're tempted by a female coworker. And you're married, you have a family, and you think, well, I'm not happy. I'm just not happy. And you start to chase after this coworker. It could be male for female, female for male. Go, go either way. And then somebody's in the workplace and say, well, you're not happy in your marriage. God wants you to be happy. Just follow your heart and go take up with that other person. Wrong. Wrong. You say, how do you know it's wrong? Here's the counsel somebody gives. Well, God says he hates divorce. All right. Now, divorce happens. There are concessions for divorce. It happens. Marital unfaithfulness, abandonment, they, those things. But it's not God's desire. And God certainly doesn't want someone to get a divorce to chase after someone. But not only that, there's a big mistake that's made in that. God wants you to be happy. Where do you see that in the scripture? I mean, God wants us to be blessed. He wants us to experience joy. There are a lot of people that think, oh, I just want to be happy. They want to, hey... A child can be happy playing in the middle of a four-lane highway. That doesn't make it right. A child can be happy to eat candy all day, but that doesn't make it right. And so somebody is, is tempted in this area, and there's the counsel that says God wants you to be happy. That would be like the other prophets. There, there's no basis for what they're saying. There's no biblical basis. But someone else who would give wise counsel would say, look, you don't follow your emotions here. You're committed. You, you don't do this. You, you, the consequences are going to be great. And so as we look at this in context, here's a man, Jeremiah, who is preaching the truth of God. It may not be swallowed easily, but in the long run, it's the right thing. And he's got the basis. He can go back and say, look at what's said here. Look at what is said there. They could know Jeremiah's word was right because it was consistent. And when you're challenged with issues in your life, the Bible is not going to be inconsistent. It's going to be consistent in truth. So we see that. We see that it's authoritative and consistent. But I want you to see a final thing. The people did not heed the word of God. We know the prophecy was fulfilled. We know that Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon ransacked the city of Jerusalem and the other nations. We know that God left only the poor in the land. Nebuchadnezzar brought in, you know, earlier than what we're looking at here because there were three stages to the exile. Um, but we know that many of the best people were taken into the land. They left the poorest people who really didn't have much to work the land for Nebuchadnezzar. But the land was destroyed and the people went into exile for 70 years. All of these nations... Were affected. But I want to specifically look at one person, Zedekiah. God told him to not resist what was happening. Now, again, there's a lot of water that's moved down the river. There were lots of opportunities earlier for the people to obey. But when Zedekiah came, God was very clear, do not kick against the goads. Do not resist. Put your necks under his yoke. Serve him and his people. Give in. Relinquish. And if you do that, God said, you may be able to stay in the land. You may be able to live. You'll be a vassal state, but you will not have all of the bad things that will happen if you disobey me. But Zedekiah didn't trust in the Lord. He may have trusted in the alliance of these five other nations who thought they could. We also know that Egypt was a pivotal player. We know back in Moses' day that Egypt was a main, a main empire. And it wasn't as powerful at this time, but it still was viable to the south. And we know that the attention of the Babylonians was in um, Egypt. And so uh, Zedekiah may have thought, well, he's focused on um, 
Egypt and not so much focused on us. And so I will do what I'm going to do. And he rebelled. In Jeremiah 39, it tells us Babylon surrounded the city. They came in. They chased out Zedekiah and all of the fighting men. And when they chased Zedekiah, they caught him. This man who was told of God, just give in. He chose to rebel. And then what happened was this. They caught him fleeing the city. They took him to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar killed all of his sons and then gouged both of his eyes out. The last thing Zedekiah saw was the death of his sons. I'm telling you today, God's word is powerful and true. He did not submit to the word of God, and he had terrible personal consequences. He heard the word, but he didn't heed it. If he had valued the word, he would have obeyed. You know, let me illustrate it in closing. Imagine for a moment you were called to transport a very valuable heirloom. You were moving maybe across the country. This was given by a beloved parent or grandparent. It was very special to you. If you were moving that, you wouldn't throw it in the back of a U-Haul. You wouldn't just throw it in a box. If it was something very important to you, you may be driving that U-Haul and it would be sitting right beside you where you had close access, where you knew it wouldn't be thrown, it wouldn't be tossed, something wouldn't fall onto it. Why? Because you treasure it. You treasure it. God's Word is a treasure. We need to value God's Word. We need to value it. And you say, well, I do value it. I love it. It makes me feel good. Well, it's more than making us feel good. The way we value God's Word is when we heed it. God has entrusted his word to us. He entrusted it back in these days. It wasn't that they didn't hear. The prophet was faithful. They heard it, but they didn't heed it. And if you do not obey the word, you can never say that you treasure the word. I close with this. There was a, a parable Jesus told about two men. In fact, they were two sons. And the father owned a vineyard. He came to the first son. He said, I want you to go out and work in my vineyard today. The son willingly said, yeah, I'll be glad to do. But then he changed his mind and he didn't go out. The second son he came to, he said, I want you to go out and work in my vineyard. And the son initially said, no, no, I won't do it. But then he repented. Then he changed his mind and went out and worked in the vineyard. And, and then Jesus asked this question, which of the two sons did his father's will. Now he was talking about people who, like the first son, were Jews who thought that they knew God and when really came not, they didn't. And, and, and then Gentiles who, who didn't know God but repented and came. But the point of the matter of the, the parable in this instance is who did the word of God? I wonder today, what is God saying to you? Is he speaking directly to you? If not, if you're not hearing from God, are you engaged in the word of God? You can't Heed what you don't hear. Are, are you de devoting yourself to, to really having the spirit of the psalmist that's saying, show me your way, and then going into the word? But if God is speaking to you, or how are you responding to that? Are you just disregarding it? Or are you heeding it? You see, trust and obey. There's no other way. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, we thank you for the lessons we can learn from, from Judah's history. And Father, we know that you loved the people because, Lord, you continually sent the prophets time and time again to speak to them. And now, Lord, right before the fall of Jerusalem, you're still saying a message to them of, of encouragement, of finding them where they were. Father, some of us today, we're not where we need to be. But you're still calling us and saying, I'm ready to reach where you are today. Father, some of us today, we need to resolve this summer to make a priority of engaging in the study of your word, not just to check off a list or not just to feel good, but Lord, looking at the word, 
studying the word, pondering it, and saying, show me your way, and then doing what it says. Father, we thank you and lift this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen.